questa settimana diamo una sola notizia, tra l'altro già data lo scorso dicembre. La fonte Rai News. Salta il concerto della pianista Filo Putin al Teatro La Fenice di Venezia. Considerata una delle più grandi interpreti di Chopin e Rachmaninov, la musicista di origine ucraina aveva suonato nella Mariupol occupata di organizzatori, virgolette, la musica e la cultura devono unire i popoli e non dividere. Primo punto. Chi è questa musicista che non viene nominata? È Valentina Lechitsky. Tra l'altro molto nota alla RAI perché già aveva suonato con l'orchestra appunto sinfonica della RAI. Questa è una delle tante notizie di cancellazioni di concerti di artisti russi in Italia. Sempre con la stessa motivazione, con la stessa etichetta, vedete, pro Putin. A questo punto abbiamo deciso non solo di dare la notizia, ma di fare qualcosa. Allora, il nostro gruppo di lavoro di Grandangolo, insieme ad altri promotori, esponenti eh, della società civile, e insieme a Bio Blu, abbiamo fatto un atto molto semplice. La Fenice ha cancellato il concerto di Valentina Lesizia e noi invitiamo Valentina Lesizia a tenere il concerto. Ci vorrebbe un romanzo di appendice per raccontare le vicende che abbiamo attraversato. Perché se è vero che hanno cancellato il concerto di Valentina Esizia e di altri artisti russi, è vero che a noi hanno cancellato una serie di teatri. Nel senso che quando siamo andati a chiedere teatri a Milano a enti religiosi e anche teatri dipendenti da istituzioni pubbliche, il Comune di Milano, ci siamo visti negare un teatro dietro l'altro, con motivazioni tipo ma questo ci metterebbe in imbarazzo, cioè una delle massime riconosciute pianiste mondiali ci metterebbe in imbarazzo, oppure a un altro teatro, sì potete venire però che nessuno lo sappia, quindi un concerto segreto, qui si ritorna appunto alla carboneria. Siamo all'incredibile. Qui abbiamo la misura della democrazia italiana in questo momento. È naturalmente una forma di guerra. Guerra che non si combatte solo per la conquista dei territori, si combatte per la conquista delle menti. Ed ecco l'idea del nemico. Ecco che perfino un artista di questo livello mondiale diventa espressione del nemico, viene etichettato. Allora non occorrono molte parole. Qui abbiamo l'intervista a Valentina De Liz. È una intervista che è qualcosa che va al di là della semplice definizione di intervista. Si scopre una persona in Valentina di una sincerità incredibile, di una capacità anche autocritica. Ebbene, tutto questo è stato ridotto allo slogan La pianista di Putin. Insieme a Bio Blu, Grandangolo ha organizzato il magnifico concerto che sarà trasmesso da Bio Blu. Ascoltiamo Valentina Lisizza, intervistata dalla giornalista e scrittrice Gin Toschi Marazzani Visconti. Valentina Lisitza, you're a famous pianist, but also a very interesting human being. Thank you. I didn't know about myself that I'm interested, but I'm, yes, I you consider are. myself just a pianist, a good one. We would like to ask you some questions about your life experience, because you were born in Kiev, started playing at the age of that three, You successfully attended uh, the Kiev Conservatory. 
In 1991, you won the U.S. Murray Dranoff Two Piano Competition with your future husband, Alexei Kuznetsov. In 1995, you made your Lincoln Center debut in New York, and you had an immense, immense success. And the United States asked you to become an American citizen. Well, now, what was your feeling about the American daily life compared to such a different life in the Ukraine? So basically, I spent all my adult life in the West, in the United States foremost, then I moved and I lived a little bit in Europe. But really, in reality, most of my life was in the US. And it was quite a change because at that time, 91, 92, most of my generation, my classmates, they also left the country because we as young people, we didn't see any hope for us, particularly in, for musicians, classical musicians, when people were struggling to make ends meet, to find something to eat, to feed their children. Music, classical music was the last thing on their mind. It, it, it was, it went from, you know, Soviet Union when it was heavily sponsored, like all the culture, you know. I was in a way blessed to receive the top, absolutely top quality education in special music school for exceptionally gifted children, to continue to study in conservatory, and also, you know, the classical piano, for example, the school, you know, it was called, and it's called, called still worldwide Russian piano school. It's just as big a brand name as Bolshoi Ballet. You know, you say Bolshoi Ballet, you know what it is about. You say Russian piano school, you know what it is about. There was all the famous, wonderful pianists and the tradition that was passed from generation to generation. But my parents were simple workers. My mother worked at a factory making dresses. My father was working at construction sites. Yet, I'm the daughter of simple, you know, proletarian, simple working class parents. I was able to study for free with the best teachers. And also, everything was open. You know, at three years old, my parents tried me in ballet, in figure skating, in swimming. Then came the piano because I was failure in all the others. But it was really incredible life, life of ease, of assurance. It was not very exciting because you knew your future well ahead. You know that you'll graduate, you'll, even if you are not terribly talented, you will still get job teaching and everything will be secure. Then comes like a rock on our heads, the dissolution of Soviet Union, unexpected, and suddenly you are left on your own, you are in different country, unknown, people do not care about what you do, people are basically trying to survive, and natural way was just to go out any place. And we considered ourselves extremely lucky to win the competition in the US, it was the first gold medal for independent Ukraine. So that was a big deal about it. We were celebrated as heroes when we came back and we went to study. Then we got visas for exceptional abilities and we became citizens in 2000, 2001, 2000, I believe. But it's incredible. But do you think you had an experience parallel to that of Sergei Rachmaninov? in the US. You know, it was different because his immigration was a forced one, but he was, he didn't know that he is living forever, that he will never come back. As many people who were also, you know, the, the country they grew in and succeeded in, it was no more, it was different country, it was not Russian Empire, Soviet Union, a lot of people left because they felt there is no future there, the country ceased to exist. And Rachmaninov went out, uh, he thought maybe for a year, for a few years, until everything settles down. And so many people did the same way. 
And when he was in the West, he was celebrated. He was the highest paid classical pianist in the world. He was conducting New York Philharmonic. Yes, he was playing in Carnegie Hall, everything. Yeah. But he couldn't compose. He lost the ability to compose with the roots, like a plant being pulled from the ground, native ground, and transplanted. But for us, it was different because we were young. We were excited. We were going to you know, the dreamland, American dream. When we saw America for the first time coming from Ukraine, you know, the magic. I remember it until this day we came on, it was close to Christmas. We fly to Miami. The door of the airplane opens. There is this humid, warm air. Then the beautiful white houses, everyone was pool, palm trees. It was a dream for us. So we came, we were excited. We were more Americans than many Americans. So we dived right in. We forgot about our native country. We were Americans. We were so happy about it. That's good. While living in the United States, how did you see Ukraine transform after it became an autonomous state? Our parents, our relatives stayed behind. Of course, we were in close contact. I went to play in Ukraine, of course, from the different position. I was admired and hated at the same time, you know, with jealousy with people who were left behind. Of course, we followed somewhat closely, but we, frankly, you know, being young, people concerned about careers, we were looking at this, oh, this is a back country, you know, for us, we're never coming back. So our parents would tell us, you know, we're saving the apartments for you because one day you will want to come back and say, never, never, never in our lives, never will repeat it. Our future is here in beautiful United States. Of course, we were following everything, what was happening, but kind of, you know, with, with the sense of superiority because we made it and other people didn't that's for sure but what happened what happened when you you and how did you feel in 2014 in 2014 especially after the odessa massacre you know watching tv on tv yes, news on tv yes when i said just a few minutes ago that we felt more americans than americans it also included, yes, of course, we knew about all the, you know, the American dream included freedom of speech, you know, everything, freedom of information, which we were deprived in the late Soviet Union. We felt, you know, like during Chernobyl times, our government didn't tell us what's happening. You know, everything was fine. And we were hearing, we were listening to the news from West that were telling us the truth. So when we came to US, of course, we, be, we learned English by watching CNN headline news okay? CNN. because it was repeating every 15 minutes and you catch everything because we came without English language but there we learned and of course you know getting citizenship being able to vote for the first time all the excitement and we believed every word that it was said on TV because we were in the free world we were in America you know, America the great the beautiful and when America went to one war another war we were supporting it, you know. We really stopped. you were really supporting it. We, you really we believed. You were really believing because, in this country because we didn't see anything from the other side. We didn't know. We knew the things that were happening in Yugoslavia, but we were too busy. We were too young to deal with it. Then, when Iraq came, we honestly believed, like majority of Americans, that we're bringing democracy and freedom to those people who are suffering under terrible dictator, and everything will be great. And we watch it on TV. I remember the moments when the statue of Saddam Hussein was taken yes. down and yes. by grateful people. You know, only now I found out, thanks to Wikipedia, that it was a setup, and yes. actually the statue yes. was taken down by Americans, and then they saw, oh, maybe it's not such a good picture. So they got some mob of people just to be on the background. But there are headlines, literally, when they changed the photo, but the headline is there that Iraqi people are taking down the statue. Yes. The, the same happened in 2014 in Kiev when they were taking Lenin's statue. But you know what was different? This time, that was a terrible disconnect. 
between what we saw on TV, what was told, and what our parents told us. I was on the phone with my mother. My husband was on the phone with his parents. You know, at first, the reaction of people in Kiev to this Maidan, you know, color revolution was, oh, you know, there are some drunkards, you know, some Nazis, they're just doing something, they're dirty. We're, do, we're going along with our work, we ignore it. Because my husband's parents went to teach in the conservatory, they passed every day, passed this Maidan crown, it doesn't concern us. But when it was happening, you know, on TV, there was excitement. People are thirsting for democratic changes. They're against corrupt government. They want you know, to join Europe. And at the same time, we hear totally different from the people we trust. You know, whom can you trust more than your own parents? Of course. And this terrible disconnect between what you see and what you know is true. It was repeated not with us, but with many people. That was happening since 2014. Like people in Donetsk who would get calls from their relatives on the other side, and they would tell, you know, they're bombing us. I say, no, you are bombing yourselves. We're, we're told on TV. It cannot be true. Say, how can you think that we are killing ourselves, that our husbands and fathers are shooting at their own children? You know, are you thinking? But CNN told us so. Is this what led you to give uh, your first concert in Donetsk in 2015? It was still one year to go. So at first, you know, because of my Ukrainian citizenship, I was even offered to go and play on, on Maidan. You know, a pianist, it's a part of every color revolution because they have like a bunch of stumps. There is usually a little girl standing with flowers across the sea of faceless, you know, guards of the regime. Then there is pianist or somebody playing. It's traditional, so they offer, they say, but why don't you go? We'll arrange for everything. I said, no, 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 I don't want to go. I don't want to have anything in common with it. But then, because I saw what was happening, I, you know, I still didn't believe that it was done purposefully at that moment because I was still in this American mood, you know, we cannot go wrong. And I tried, I started translating the video snippets, what was happening, and I posted it on Twitter. I was, actually, I thought I'm helping, honestly, because I was helping the journalists I thought maybe they have lack of understanding of Ukrainian. It's difficult because I, I learned Ukrainian perfectly in school, so I was Russian speaking. I was helping. I was helping them get different views because they didn't understand everything that was going on Maidan. Yeah, there is like de uh, demand for democratic reforms. You know, people are tired of corrupt government, which is fair. And at the same time, there are real neo-Nazis who are promoting hatred on the same tribune. You know, they're, they're reciting verses about Galadamor, that famous, you know, uh, the tragedy that happened in, 30s, uh, yes. in 1930s when people were dying of starvation. Yes, yes, of but course. Reciting verses saying that Jews are responsible for it. And you translate it and tell people, but you have to cover everything. You have to give the full picture, the full background, because otherwise people don't know. It's not everything rosy and beautiful. There are terrible forces behind it, forces for evil. How can you not tell it? And then it was told before, you know, shut up your mouth, mouth and mind your business, go to your piano and don't speak. I'm very stubborn. Like I, all females in our family, they have strong characters. The more they told me to stop, the more actively I was doing it. I found some journalists, even in the US, who found what my research, my information helpful. They were thanking me privately. They were using it in articles in Wall Street Journal, even in Washington Post, in Jerusalem Post. They, they were using it. And I thought, you know, I'm doing great. And then came the moment when in, uh, I was supposed to perform in Canada, in Toronto, and suddenly my concert was canceled, canceled. for the first time in my life. And the reasons that they were given that I was, uh, you know, I was rude, I, I spoke terribly of Ukrainian people, you know, I abused them. And, and they used the quotes which I translated. They were 
quotes of other people which I translated, they ascribe it, those quotes to me. And they say, I said it, you know, I called Ukrainian people different, you know, bad names. Those were, those were exact quotes that were translated. But in reality, what was happening with cancellation, they found a good excuse, they manufactured it. But they said that I'm actually, I, I speak badly of Stefan Bandera. Ah. Yes, uh, yes, I offend the memory of those great freedom fighters who fought alongside Nazis. Well, of course. Yeah. Of course. And also the calls came, as they told me, you know, later, the information, you know, it, it became a whole picture. The call went actually from as far as from office of Hillary Clinton, because there was Ukrainian person working there, and she told them, you know, they should really cancel me. And it was after this concert in Toronto that I got invitation on Facebook from the director of Philharmonic, Philharmonic Society of Donetsk if I could come and play. And I said, of course, I will do it. And people there, you know, they thought I'm brave. I never thought, you know, of bravery. I really thought even at that moment that freedom of speech, freedom of information, you know, everything that's written in constitution, it's above everything. I went there not being partial to particular side, but I went to defend the rights of all people to know the truth. I came, I played, and as I understood, the shock was profound shock because it was broadcast. It shown the people of Donbass as people because they were constantly dehumanized. Dehumanized, that's right. Yes. yes. You know, they were talking about, you know, all oh, those, you know, this population which is low education, they're drunks, they don't know better, that's why they resist democracy. And suddenly people all over the world see, you know, the famous pianist comes, they put a piano, a symphony orchestra, and there, there is a sea of people. It was 15,000 people. 15,000 people. Yes, and still after, short while after they were bombed, so many times, so many people died, they came outside, they risked their lives because of such a gathering of people. It's a very tempting target. You know, they compared that concert to the performance of Leningrad Symphony of Shostakovich uh -huh. in yeah, Shostakovich, yes, right. in, in, during siege. And it shown the entire world that those were not, you know, terrible orcs, or they say, you know, they, they dehumanize them. Those were people, you know, little children, elderly, sitting, mesmerized, listening to Rachmaninov, to Tchaikovsky, to Prokofiev. Valentino Lisitsu. Сергей Рахманинов, концерт для фортепиано с оркестром номер два, первая и третья часть. Of course, I made all the enemies in the West by doing that concert, but I regained my land. You know, my well, people, I came home. Of course. Then I realized that, yes, my home was always there with these people, and I can give them something. And they give me so much in exchange from their hearts. That's an incredible story. And then you played again in Mariupol in 2022. And again, and again, I think in 2023, in front of the Ukrainian embassy in Moscow. Yes, I went to Donbass every year since. I did many concerts, I did master classes, I taught little children, aspiring musicians all the time. I came to Mariupol when it was just celebrating their first 9th of May, the day of victory over Nazi Germany. Oh, yes. And this is, was the first time in so many years people could celebrate in open. It was very, very moving, you know, city lay in the ruins. People were just coming back, making ends meet. You know, some, we came with volunteers 
of, from all walks of life. Amazing. You know, we had incredible political arguments when we were driving because they were communists, anarchists, monarchists, you know, everything. It doesn't, you know, people think, oh, you know, it's all Putin people. Yes, no. No, they were all different, but they all felt compelled to do something to help their fellow humans. We came, we spend the day, you know, baking breads, bringing breads to people who were still living in destroyed buildings. Then they found little upright, so the young boy, they took the piano from the cafeteria, they put it on the corner of the street, and I played, and people just kept coming, and people came with little chairs, old ladies brought their little babies around. It, it was surreal. In a way. Surreal, Surreal, completely. But something, you know, something you live your entire life to give just that moment to people. I felt myself needed. Beauty was taking over. Yes, because, you know, as a musician, you, you are entertainer. You have to give people pleasure. But at the same time, I was given more than pleasure. And people, you know, they have wounded hearts. They yeah. saw so much destruction, so much tragedy. And the music was healing for them. Absolutely. And then you went to, to play in front of the embassy in Moscow. Yes, Ukraine it, embassy, it was in a memory of, of yes. the Odessa massacre. Yes. Yes. Odessa is where part of my family was hailing from. They spent generations and generations building Odessa into what it was during Russian Empire, Soviet Union, everything. And it was my town. I remember when I watched it on TV and I was monitoring the news when this terrible tragedy happened, when people were brutally burned alive. That's terrible. It was awful. So every, every time, every May 2nd, it was just, you know, the, the day that's coming up again. Again. It's just to think of those people who were there with hopes, with message of peace, of brotherhood. Because, you know, Brother, people were yeah. not there. You know, they're called separatists. In fact, when, how can you call someone a separatist when people say, you know, we are the same people. We may speak different languages, different, different accents, everything, but we are the same. We are brothers. Of course. How can you do this to us? How can you tear us apart? And these people were called separatists, and they say they deserve to die. And also, you know, that moment when they were broadcasting it live on Ukrainian TV. It was like talk show. And then somebody comes, some journalist, so-called journalist, and say, oh, you know, all who, who died there in the fire, they had Russian passports. And the audience stands up and applauds. Oh, that's it terrible. Was, it was, my God, look at how people, you know, were living in 21st century. We have all the civilization, we have all the culture, and people are applauding the death, even if they were Russians. Now we're going backwards. It, it turned out that it was not true. It was their fellow citizens that they killed. Well, how do you experience what is happening in Ukraine and in Europe today? You know, Ukraine, first of all, again, what they show on TV, on broadcast, they try to show, you know, like single opinion, you know, everybody's goose-stepping <laughs> under command. In Ukraine, there is no freedom left. There is one TV channel, and all the others are required to broadcast what they're told. There is no dissent allowed, no protest. You know, everybody who protests, even tiny bit, they are declared collaborators. You know, people are afraid. You know, I, I communicate with so many people on the other side. And we are afraid for each other because you, you say, you know, you write something. And you say, you know, let's delete it because they are afraid at any moment, you know, secret service can come, knock on their door, look at their phone, and they are taken in a known direction to never come back. They disappear.
They disappear. Yes, so many people. You know, the same happened, you know, when Russia entered parts of, you know, close to Kharkov, then they went back. And that was tragedy for people because it was so, happening so quickly, like Russian troops evacuated in two hours. And people who were totally, you know, for Russians, they had no time to react. And then Ukrainians came and these people started disappearing without oh, trace. Yeah. And nobody speaks about it. I represent, because I'm Ukrainian citizen, I'm American citizen, Ukrainian, now Russian, also because I was given citizenship of Donetsk People's Republic, and because, thanks to that, I was able also to acquire Russian citizenship to move freely. And I represent all of those countries. You know, I don't deny any, I don't want to say that I don't want to be considered Ukrainian or even American, because there is other America, there is other Ukraine, and there is other Europe. You know, not Europe that's sending weapons and dehumanizing people and saying, you know, Russia should be disbanded, pulled into small countries. No, there is, uh, there is always other Europe, other US, other Ukraine. And I represent those two. Now, my last question. Um, how do you see your future? In the USA, in Europe, where? <sighs> you know, Music is our universal heritage. You know, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, they're not Russian composers. They belong to all the humanity. Despite what was, you know, ugliest things, when they tried to ban Russian composers, to stop people from reading Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, because people can learn quite a bit, even from, you know, in, Tol in Tolstoy, uh, there are, children stories, short children, which I read as a child, and one is particularly ringing true. It's a parable about father who is dying and he calls all his children, all his sons to his bedside. And he gives them a bouquet, tied up bouquet of willow tree branches. And he tells them, break it. And they try, but because it's tied, they are not able, it just bends, but it never breaks. Then he unties it and says, now break it. And of course, little branches snap like that. And he tells them, remember this lesson. If you are together, you will never be breakable. But if you separate, they will destroy you one by one. And that is what it is. We have to stick together music, culture, is one thing that unites us all. Rachmaninoff rings true, goes directly to the heart of, of a Russian, of Italian, of Chinese, of Japanese, of Belgian, of Brazilian. It, it's, it's a universal language. And I think, you know, I honestly believe that all wars eventually end. People come back to their senses, like they wake up from the nightmare, and there is a time you know, time to throw the stones, and t time to collect the stones, and there, is, there will be time of rebuilding, time of creation. And I think it will come. I hope to be able to see this time, and, but at least our children will see it. And where will you be? I will be with my people. And your people is where? It's Russia, it's Ukraine, it's a country that's coming back together. And I hope that we'll all remember that we are brothers and there is nobody closer than the family. You know, other people can talk sweet stories, entice you, but there is, there is nobody closer than your own family. And you stick together, you work your differences. You know, there are arguments in any family. You have to live through it for the sake of the children. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you so much and welcome here. Thank you. Thank you.